This is your Anxiety Toolkit, episode number 108. Welcome to Your Anxiety Toolkit. I'm your host, Kimberly Quinlan. This podcast is fueled by three main goals. The first goal is to provide you with some extra tools to help you manage your anxiety. Second goal, to inspire you. Anxiety doesn't get to decide how you live your life. And number three, and I leave the best for last, is to provide you with one big fat virtual hug. Because experiencing anxiety ain't easy. If that sounds good to you, let's go. Well, welcome back. Amazing family. I just love you guys. (laughs) Oh, you guys. I'm in a funny mood. I can't help it. (laughs) This is an amazing episode. You know, I'm actually quite geeked out right now. And it's because we have the amazing Dan Furlong on. And he is going to talk with us about so many things. And I can't tell you, I'm totally geeking out right now because Dan Furlong, you know, this whole episode is the I did a hard thing segment. Let's just say that there isn't any specific one from Facebook or Instagram. The entire episode is an I did a hard thing segment. (laughs) And Dan, holy smackaroos, did he do a hard thing. Dan is an amazing OCD advocate and is the man behind male anxiety depression Instagram handle. And he did a hard thing. I'm actually going to keep it really short here because holy moly, did he do a hard thing. And I am so intrigued by this. That This is just right up my alley. I just love to hear about this kind of thing. He ran in the Jungle Ultra in Peru, which is literally running through the jungle, the Amazon jungle, by himself running through rivers and vines and deep forests and cliffs and sleeping in hammocks. I'm just going to leave you guys to listen to this episode because it is so inspiring. He drops some major wisdom about mental health along the way. And he talks about his motto of taking the path of least resistance. And I just love this story so much. And I know you guys will too. I mean, I love it on a deep level, but I also love it on this highly excited level Like I said, I kind of geek out over this kind of stuff. So I'm just going to go straight to the episode, enjoy it, and you guys are just going to love Dan. So I'll see you guys next week. Okay, so welcome. I am beyond excited for this episode, mainly because my curiosity is through the roof. We have today Dan Furlong, who is probably my most... Oh my, you're on the top of my list in terms of admiration right now. Welcome, Dan. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And that's pretty cool to be on top of your list there. Oh my gosh. So Dan, tell me, okay, so let me just tell you, I have been following you, um, male anxiety, depression on Instagram for some time. I knew you were preparing for some kind of fundraiser, but I didn't quite understand the extent to this fundraiser for OCD Action. Is that correct? Yes, correct. Yeah. UK-based charity for obsessive compulsive disorder. Right. And I'll link that in the show notes. But I didn't quite grasp the extent to what you were doing. So tell us what it was that you were training for. Tell us the story behind this absolutely incredibly inspiring story. Right. So you, you didn't grasp the extent of it. And I don't think I did as, <laughs> I I did as well. Uh, let, me, let me tell you, what I've just done was one of the hardest and most dangerous things I've ever done. And bearing in mind, I sort of January 2018, I ran 600 kilometers through the Himalayan mountains in Nepal, uh, which I did in 17 days. I didn't think anything was going to be harder or tougher than that. But the The run that I just did was a 230k five-day stage race through the Amazon jungle of Peru. And uh, 
yeah, it was the word I would use to describe it was it uh, would be relentless. It was just in, it was just insane, and it was it was beautiful and exciting and uh, thing. But yeah, it was uh, it was an epic challenge. Why did you choose this particular race? Tell us your backstory here of like, I know if everyone can go back and watch the Instagram, are the Instagram stories on like a highlight? Yeah, I've, I've, I've put some of the uh, the run. So I actually documented the, the run from the moment of leaving Heathrow Airport in London all the way through to, to getting back home. So I put it all on Instagram stories, but of course I've selected some of the videos for the uh, for the Instagram highlights. So yeah, some people can check it out. Right. On- so I have to tell you, I was addicted to watching this. Like I was watching it <laughs> over and over again. Like I just watched your stories over and over again. And then I'd lay in bed and I'd show my husband and I'd be like, you have to see this. And the, the it was like watching some kind of, it was a story. It was like every day you get an update on it. And you were kept sharing how it related to your mental health, you know, journey. Just tell me everything. <laughs> yeah, so why don't why don't I start? Obviously, a lot of your listeners won't know me, and 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 they won't know my mental health story. So, let me start there, and then we can sort of build on that. Does that sound cool? Yeah, I love it. Okay, so I had a uh, a twenty year battle with obsessive compulsive disorder in the form of intrusive thoughts and I always say that there's there's only one thing worse than growing up with OCD and that's growing up not knowing that you had it and the nature of my OCD so it started off with as a result of some bullying it the first thing that my OCD latched onto was fear of sexuality so that started around about 11 years old and then at 15, it switched because we know that OCD, well, I've learned that OCD gets bored and likes to switch themes. Uh, it switched to fear of harm at 15. And, you know, for the, the 20 years that I was struggling in silence with OCD, I lived in a place which I called a suicide limbo. And the suicide limbo is a is a place where I didn't want to live anymore because of the nature and the burden of my intrusive thoughts. Yet I didn't want to to die either because I had a beautiful loving family. I loved my sport, always been really into into my sport. And you know, there's always that little little part of the brain for, of an OCD sufferer that says like these thoughts don't mean anything. You're going to one day find a way to stop these intrusive thoughts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So from a very, very young age, I started to medicate with alcohol. So not only did I have a 20-year struggle with OCD, I had a 15-year battle with alcohol and addiction as well. And, you know, cut long story short, when people just think you're an alcoholic, it, it, it gets even worse. But I still couldn't share, even with my mum and dad, what was going on with me inside my brain. And the sort of the consequences got really, really great. And it come to a point where my mum and dad said, look, you need to stop drinking. You need to get help with this. Otherwise, you know, you're going to lose us. So I got clean and sober first. And then it took me two and a half years to get clean and sober. And it was one of the hardest things I've ever done because I I knew that I was an alcoholic and I knew I had to stop drinking. But every time I stopped, my OCD would start and I wouldn't know how to handle my intrusive thoughts and I would always go back to the alcohol and uh, but cut long story short I got clean and sober first two and a half years of of going to meetings and doing the 12-step fellowship and then I was introduced to a psychiatrist and who specializes with alcoholics and addicts and I actually sort of started to drip feed him some of the intrusive thoughts that I was having and I remember him saying to me look you don't need to see me you need to go a couple of doors down in the clinic and see dr monica and i remember saying okay like who's dr monica and he said she's clinical consultant psychologist so here in the uk that means that she's been practicing for over 25 years and and really (laughs) and legit and so i went down to see her and for the very first time in my life i actually just let it all out and you know, talking about fear of harm 
is so so scary and uh and i've been keeping this stuff in for as i say for 20 like 15 years by this point and but i let it all out and and she told me that that i was suffering with obsessive compulsive disorder and my my natural reaction was no i'm not <laughs> uh i'd heard about ocd and i heard that it was just an attention to tidiness and attention to cleanliness and i said to her look you can you can ask my mum she'll back me up i do not have ocd and uh, and there's me telling a psychologist that what i do have and what i don't have and then dr monica explained intrusive thoughts to me and that she explained fear of harm was quite a common intrusive thought and so that was the start of my journey into recovery for OCD. And so sort of fast forward three years, I, I I was introduced to OCD action. And uh, once I was introduced to OCD action, I started to get a little bit braver with stuff. And and I and I, I just naturally fell into becoming a like an OCD advocate or or a spokesman for for the charity. And I just decided that I wanted to sort of do something to to give back to OCD Action because they've been such a great support to me. And I look at the work that they're doing here in the UK and it's just it's just fantastic. So that's how I got that's kind of my mental health backstory and, and how I got involved with OCD Action. Wow. And so and that's what you kept talking about was this run comparative to that. And it sounds like you have overcome many hard things. What role has your exercise been in that? Yeah, so I always say that if you can endure OCD, then you can endure anything. And the, my approach to sort of my approach to my own mental health and, and to, to helping people through now anxiety and depression isn't your sort of your mainstream mental health protocol what i tend to do is i tend to try and focus on the four what i call the four circles approach to mental health so the first circle is biology and that includes fitness and nutrition uh, the second circle is psychology so it's working with a therapist such as like, like very similar to yourself and exploring all the things wonderful forms of treatment that you guys offer and then the final two circles so it's a spiritual circle where i kind of believe in a higher power i try and help others i try and deflate my ego and then the final one is the social circle and that's just about changing the conversation around mental health and that that kind of stuff but getting back to your question on on how important is fitness to me fitness and nutrition is probably yeah it's hard to pick one but that's that's been my best treatment over the years combined with obviously erp for my for my ocd but for my for my depression battles with depression over the years fitness and nutrition are are very very important right right and so let me just talk about that really quickly so tell us what depression looks like for you like so you've talked about harm you've talked about the different ocd stuff that happened but what does depression look like because i know it looks like different to everybody yeah and you know my first thoughts of suicide were in and around well ocd didn't just gradually come into my life it it arrived slapped me in the face and then it never left and uh you know everybody (laughs) i've spoken to a lot of ocd sufferers and everybody always thinks that their ocd is worse than other people's but (laughs) so i'm not i'm not saying mine was but it was off the charts it was it was horrendous it was horrendous and you know, feeling suicidal at 11 years old, crying yourself to sleep at night, that sort of stuff. But I, depression is is just debilitating. And, you know, I'm someone who can run 230k in five days through a jungle, yet depression can literally have me laying down on the couch not wanting to move. It's, it's that powerful if, if I let it be that powerful. And... You know, I, I, there's always always those cheesy analogies, but it really is like the weather. Sometimes it just turns up and it's a rainy day. Other times it's a storm. Other times it's a it's a whole winter. But yeah, it's it's it's, it's hard to sort of describe. But it is very very real. That's what I, that's how I would describe it. Right, right. Thank you for sharing that because I think 
I think that, you know, you're doing amazing stuff, particularly talking, you know, around with males around this because it's something we don't talk about a lot and and it's different for every person. So I really appreciate how open you are with that. Okay, so uh, I, I'm happy for you to go in any direction because I could listen to you all day. But um, tell me, why did you choose to do the Peru run? Yeah, so that and that kind of links to depression as well because, as I said, in January 2018, I ran 600 kilometres through the Himalayan mountains in Nepal in 17 days. And that was a run that I did for a children's charity called the Blink Now Foundation, which I'm heavily involved with. It's a, it's a beautiful charity. It's, a, it's a, an orphanage, a, a school and, uh, and, and, a, and a teenage safe house for, for children out in the western region of Nepal. And I did the run and we raised an epic amount of money and I did it in 17 days and everything was just amazing and it was really successful. And I came back from Nepal with the plan to have a very, very productive year. It was actually during that run that I made a decision that I was going to launch MAD. So I was going to launch Mal Anxiety and Depression and that I was going to start changing the conversation around men's mental health. So I came back with all these massive plans and then I ended up having a very unproductive 2018 and I found myself not running anymore. I, I, I was hardly training and I was just slipping in, slipping back into into a depression and my intrusive thoughts were getting bad again and I was getting myself into a rut so as I said fitness has always been my thing so I decided to go for a run just to I knew I needed to break that cycle so I went out for a run and I, I put a podcast on I listened to the the Joe Rogan experience and uh and Joe had Tyson Fury on his podcast. Now, Tyson Fury is is the heavyweight boxer, and he's not everybody's favourite cup of tea. He's said some things in the past when when he wasn't in a good space, which I don't agree with. But he openly spoke about his battle with depression, which almost took, where he almost took his own life. And he said something that just really resonated with me. He said, you need to goal set your way out of depression. And that sort of, I was thinking, yeah, goal set my way out of depression. That's that's powerful. And then, as I say, I, I believe in the universe and the universe works in, in strange ways. The next day I went up and to London to meet a very good friend of mine who's also a runner. And he said to me, to this day, I don't know whether he knew that I was in a, that I was slipping into depression. But the next day, he said to me, "I've got something to show you." And I was like, "All right, what's that?" And he showed me a YouTube video of the Jungle Ultra in Peru, and he said, "Have you seen this?" And uh, he knew what he was doing. He was basically planting a seed in me because he knew that once once I had had a look at this video of this epic jungle adventure that I was going to do it and uh, I signed up to it the next day and that was and then that was when I decided that this time around instead of doing it for my children's charity I'm actually going to do it for OCD action and and and, and here I am all the way through till sort of today where I'm out the other side of the jungle and and and, and, and life is good yeah okay this is amazing Okay, so now I have to I have to know what's going on. What tell me about I what I really want to understand is what was going through your head as you did this run. What did you have to get how, what did you have to use to get through it? What mental tactics did you have to use? You know, describe to me the whole experience as best as you can. Yeah, no problem at all. So well, I was definitely fearful going in and the main reason I was fearful was because obviously I was doing it for OCD action and when you're doing these things for, for, for charity it just adds so much pressure to something that is already very very challenging and difficult and I, I, I knew how many people were going to be watching me uh, before I left we'd raised we'd already raised over five thousand pounds so there was a lot of people who have donated uh, and yeah it was uh, and, and when you suffer with an anxiety disorder anyway these sort of things uh, 
yeah, these sort of things can play on on your mind. Uh, but on the flip side of that, I knew that I had the experience of Nepal. I'd, I'd already done something like this, so I could draw on that. And I also knew that, as I said before, that some of the things that I've endured in my life means that I can draw on those bad times to to help me get through any difficult situation so I knew that I'd be able to draw on when I was really really struggling in the jungle I knew I'd be able to draw on you know some of the 24 hours of intrusive thoughts that were just seven days a week those those sort of things I'd be able to draw on and get through Uh, and I knew as well that the the accountability uh that comes with doing runs like this the accountability would mean that i would never ever give up and and giving up is not in my nature anyway so so that was something that i, that I would draw on and especially on like some of the hill climbs and stuff like that i would i i was actually thinking about i just a couple of weeks before i left i i, I was the closing speaker at the oc action conference and and it was a beautiful conference and I got to meet so many teenagers especially who blessed them their OCD journey was just starting and when I was really struggling on some of the hill climbs in the jungle because we're talking about climbs that are five seven eight kilometers high I would think about those youngsters who's whose life is just getting turned upside down by OCD and 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 how the money that I'm going to be raising and if I'm successful in the jungle how that might sort of help them not suffer as long as I suffered and and that was really really enough to to, to spur me on and, and keep me going and then the other part of it as well is that only like only when I do these sort of dangerous runs do I feel truly free and whilst I was on the run I had no anxiety no depression okay I had the odd occasional intrusive fault uh, mainly when I was running running on the uh, on the uh, on the side of a ravine I was running with my friends and stuff like that and of course I would get the intrusive fault of what if I was to suddenly push my friend off this ravine and stuff but I was able just to just to note that so she did and like and, and just dismiss it and so sort of thing but for the most part I felt I felt truly free and it was just, just just an amazing experience right oh my goodness and and it captured it as well like literally like I don't think I, I've never been to the Amazon jungle but it's like you know you're like pushing vines out of the way and you're showing this uphill hike it didn't even really look like there was a path is that correct yeah so basically the 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 route is marked out by the some some peruvian runners the night before they they go out and they mark they mark the route and you follow you follow the route so we crossed everything from thick dense jungle to to rivers i mean i did we had to do eight kilometers up up a for a, for a river so we, we was traversing this river for for eight kilometers uh there was major hill climbs there was roads through villages that we had three days of torrential rain as well the worst rain the race has ever seen so that just made the the trails so muddy and so slippery and uh sometimes i was grabbing hold of i would grab hold of trees and some trees would take your weight other trees would just snap and uh yeah it's just, how, how i got through without getting injured is uh uh is amazing <laughs> really honestly and and there were many the thing that i loved i don't know why i enjoyed watching you go through this terribly hard thing so much <laughs> I, I promise that, you that i great. wasn't it wasn't coming from a sadistic place i was so in admiration of you is um, there were times where you were talking about how you actually weren't sure in those moments. Like you'd say, I'm, I'm kind of not going to be on Instagram a lot. I've got to just put my head down. Like, tell me about those really hard moments. Yeah. I, I, the, the, the hard moments I think, are uh, again, is, a, is another reason why, another reason why I do these kind of things, because I think only when you, when you struggle and, and 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 only when you experience 
real pain do you truly find out who you are and you know these the run presented challenges that that I, that on a on a whole new level that I'd, I'd faced before and I really just did keep saying to myself this is your ultimate test you, you, if you can get through this then then you can get through then you can get through anything and uh and yes sort of in a strange sort of way I, I i really enjoyed being in the deep water that the, the jungle puts you in and it really does put you in because like you're halfway up there's no turning back so you, you've got to keep going it's, it's survival basically yeah. yeah it really really was okay so this is one thing my curiosity is really i want to hear about is not only did you do this since I was a kid, I've loved watching like Iron Man and and I just love this kind of stuff. Mainly yeah, because I'm just so impressed with what the body can endure. You know, I, I have a fascination with that. Now, tell yeah. me about this wasn't just a physical thing for you. You also had really interesting sleeping arrangements. Yeah. So the race is a self-sufficient race, which means that on your back you have to carry your sleeping bag you have to carry your hammock and i'll tell you about the hammock in a minute you have to carry your medical supplies the equipment that you need and then you also have to carry five days worth of food because the only thing that you're provided with is water and at the end of each day you would you'd cross the finish line and then there would be a the, the event organizers would have a base camp which is set up and inside the base camp you would have these these wooden poles that the, the Peruvian locals put up and then you would have to you would have to put your own hammock up and that's where you would be sleeping for, for that night so yeah for the five days I, I slept in a hammock and I, I'd never slept in a hammock before in my life so uh, <laughs> and I'm not the uh, I'm a former insomniac as well, so I'm I'm not the best sleeper. Uh, So I was literally doing these runs on two, three hours sleep every night. And the final night, I only had one hour's sleep. Uh, Oh, my gosh. (laughs) <laughs> yeah so like going back to your, your your point about the human body it's like it's amazing how much you can actually endure and if you don't give up you're you're capable of so much more than than you think you are right okay so if i'm doing something hard you know my yeah. my motto is it's a beautiful day to do hard things if cool. i'm doing something hard the reason i say it's a beautiful day to do hard things is because i think my default is to say, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this. Like that just, my brain tends to default to those few words. Yeah. What, was your brain defaulting to anything negative during that? Or was your, have you done so much mental work that your brain defaults to something different? Yeah, I think, uh, well, I don't think it's just your brain that, that tries to do that. I think the, the human brain and the human nature in general will always try and take the path of least resistance and it will always try and talk you out of doing difficult things. And, you know, it, as I say, my, my 20 year struggle with with OCD and, and depression, it would I, I would always take the easier, softer path and and I would never... I would never achieve anything and I would I like I underachieved my whole life. Uh so since coming into sort of recovery, I, I call it, I've always challenged myself to take the, the the harder route in 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 everything that I do from business to training to personal development, I always try and take the harder route and I knew that this run was going to present me with an option on day 4 and day 5. There's an op- option to do the long course or you can or you can take the easier softer route and you can do do the short course and I made a decision before I went that my my goal other than finishing it was I'm gonna 110 percent I want to do the long course and I and I knew that if I complete the long course I would I would become sort of uncommon amongst uncommon so I spent a lot of time before I got to Peru sort of meditating and praying and and making sure that uh, there was no option for me other than to do the long course so I I had the mindset going in that that I wasn't gonna 
I wasn't going to choose the soft course. I was going to go for the harder route. Right. And and so, I mean, okay, so I'll have to paint you a picture here because you're going to laugh. So I remember I've been having my own medical issues. Everybody on the podcast knows about this. And so I was actually in bed one of the days watching you resting and my daughter came in and I was laying down and all of a sudden I was like up sitting up in my bed and I was like on my knees and I was I had my phone in my hand and I was like because you were talking about this idea of like I had to get to the long course before three o'clock or something yes that's correct right yeah. and then I and then you're like and I made it and I my whole body just jumped up and was like hooray like I was so excited for you like I couldn't believe that you'd done it I was so happy for you leading up to that was it was this you know, I think you even said you got there an hour early is that correct yeah so I got to on both days I got to the cut off uh, an hour and a half before on 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 both days so i had to be at the the the, the third checkpoint by three o'clock and on both days funnily enough i arrived but both days i arrived at half one it was just a funny little coincidence so yeah so i had an hour and a half on both days to spare so uh, incredible so, but i'm glad that it sort of Im- improved your day because uh, yeah <laughs> oh my gosh with- I just get excited. I get excited thinking about it. It really did. It made my day. I was like every day I couldn't wait to get home and check out what was going on. It was kind of like I was watching like a show that the next season was coming out. Oh, wow. Wow. That that makes me happy. And uh, because when you post this kind of stuff on social media, you have no idea. I just think that no one's watching and nothing I've got to say is interesting. And (laughs) like my negative, like the negative voice in my head will say, why are you doing this and that? But that hearing stories like that makes it all worthwhile. Oh, it really was so great for me. It was really so great for me. So I have a question about that because I know for a lot of the clients I see, When they're pushing themselves to do something really hard, like you said, you know, you take the harder route. Yeah. Often clients of mine, I've done this myself in the past, I know it's a very normal human reaction, is to get mentally really hard on yourself to be able to reach that goal kind of to beat yourself up a little, like, come on, you know, like using a really kind of harsh voice. What voice did you have to use to get to any of this? What What's the voice sound like? Is it a little aggressive or is it very gentle? What What's your take in terms of how you talk to yourself to do the hard thing? Because I think a lot of people really struggle with how to, they think they have to beat themselves to accomplish something. So I'm curious to know your thoughts. Yeah, so... I actually listened to a uh, I listened to a book by an audio book by a, a, a guy who's a massive inspiration to me called David Goggins and David Goggins is a an ex US Navy SEAL and he, he's just a real he's a he's a real hardcore guy and he's also an ultra runner and he's got also got the world record for like the most chin-ups in one day like 2000 plus chin-ups in one day and stuff like that so he was a really really cool guy that I really really like and I listened to his book as I was training for for the run and he had a, a series of of different techniques to use to help you get through these like these epic challenges so I was using those uh when things got tough in the jungle but yeah I I don't know, I guess maybe it's because my rugby background that I've always been quite a, sort of aggressive with myself. Uh, so, yeah, uh, on a few occasions I was having loud, let's just put them as loud outbursts in the middle of the jungle. Really? <laughs> yeah. But getting back to your question, like the run, there was there was 57 runners on, on the run and I was fascinated to see how different people get themselves through. So some people were crying, some people were effing and blinding like I I were. Some people were just some some were just calm the whole way through. I it's just it was it was fascinating to see how different all of the different strategies people use to 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 get through it. But yeah, mine is definitely 
having a serious word with myself and uh and uh, uh yeah aggressive uh outbursts <laughs> aggressive verbal outbursts I, I i didn't start ripping the jungle up or anything <laughs> and so that's really fascinating to me i i would love the psychology of that it's just i'd love to be have a little narrative of each person and the what you know what was the person who was crying thinking and what I think it just shows that we all have different ways of doing it that there's no right way I'm so fascinated by the psychology of what people think to get them through hard things for you at the end of the day what was it like were you too exhausted to celebrate what mentally was going on for you at the end of each day I think it was like a marathon every day, right? Something. Yeah, so it was a marathon every day, and the final day was a marathon and a half, so 70 kilometres on, on the final day. At the end of each day, I try and practice, I try and practice gratitude at the end of each day. Uh, so I always thank uh, my higher power for, for getting me through and, and for getting me through injury-free and, and then just sort of grateful that, I was able to have the experience that that I had and and stuff like that, but then you kind of as soon as you get back to base camp, it's full on. So you, your admin when you're when you're doing these kind of things just is a, is a crucial part of it, and it just takes over. So you, you have to sort your hammock out, you have to sort your feet out, you have to hi- rehydrate, you have to refuel, you have to shower, you have to. Fit. And by the time you've done everything, it's the, the the sun's gone down, and you're in your hammock trying to get to sleep. So there was a lot of downtime in in the hammock. But the the good thing about what I was doing was that I was sorting out all of my social media content when I was in my <laughs> hammock. So. <laughs> Like everyone everyone on the run was just like laughing at me because they're all there racing and uh and and doing what they're doing and not only am i racing i'm racing and doing it on social media so i've got my phone out the whole way i've got my gopro out and yeah. i'm so grateful you did it, yeah. I, it really i am i feel like it was such a cool thing to watch i could watch it all day long oh wow wow thank you thank yeah, you yeah so good okay so you finished the race. You're done now. What what's gone through your head now? Yeah, so I knew what was coming and I knew that the bus ride back to uh I knew that the bus ride back to uh Cusco, which is the 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 city of of Peru where where we flew into. I knew it was a 6-hour bus ride. I knew that I would have no phone signal whatsoever. And I was expecting, I was expecting the worst for that bus ride because it was literally taking you out of the Amazon, where I was feeling truly free, back into the real world, albeit you were still in a in a foreign country. And I was expecting my intrusive thoughts to to fire, and they they didn't let me down. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I had six hours in. I had six hours in my own head, which is never a good place to be, uh, on on the bus ride back. And things were getting dark very, very quickly. So as soon as I got back to Cusco, I checked myself into a different hotel because I wanted to be away from everybody for a little bit. And uh, I took myself straight to the closest gym, which I knew had a boxing bag and boxing's a a big part of my training as well and I lifted some weights for the very first time in months because I hadn't been lifting weights during the training period for or Peru hit the bag and then I went out and had instead of having a, a sort of everybody was rushing to get a unhealthy meal I rushed and I rushed and had a healthy meal healthy smoothie and the the next day it was it was a lot better and then I decided when I got back to the UK that this time round I'm going to carry on. I'm not going to let my I'm not going to let my fitness drop, and I'm, and I'm going to make because I lost six kilos as well during the run. So yeah, so I said to myself as well, I'm not going to let my fitness drop. I'm going to carry on eating really really well, and I'm going to try and keep the weight off, and I'm just going to carry on like attacking it so that I don't 
experience what I experienced after the last big event. And so far, so good. I've I've, I've had a couple of good weeks training, uh, a couple of good weeks eating really well, and I've been really productive with Mad and yeah, think, and, and and doing this today. It's, it, it's all been pretty awesome since I've been back. Right. Oh, I'm so impressed. Really, I am. I love. It's just so cool. I really, really admire you. I really do. I think that you bring a lot of humility and honesty and authenticity to this story. So thank you. Oh, thank you. No, it's uh, it's really nice to be able to share it with you. And uh, and I know that you're doing fantastic work and a lot of people, not just OCD people, but I know a lot of people with anxiety in general follow your account. And, and it's great just to be able to reach out to them and and share my message with them as well. So thank you. Of course. Tell us where people can find you. Yeah, so the, the best way, if they're on Instagram, follow Mal Anxiety Depression on Instagram. And they can also find me on Facebook with Mal Anxiety Depression as well. And what's really exciting, which is something that I'm was thinking about during the run, is that I'm going to launch a, a private Facebook group. It's going to be for guys only. Uh, so... Uh, sorry ladies but this one's for for guys only uh it's going to be called the mad lounge and the mad lounge is going to be a facebook group which has got two or three really good contributors who are going to be contributing on all the things i've spoken about so fitness nutrition psychology spirituality and it's just going to be a real real place of action where where guys can get some real solutions to try and uh, turn the tables on their own on their own battles love it i love it well i will link all of that into the show notes and thank you so much dan for all that you've done i will also link in the show notes a link to dan's fundraiser for ocd action and so if anyone wants to donate there they can go in and throw in some money and we need to get you over next year for the OCD Action Conference. We yes, need to get, on, we need would, to get you, you on that stage. I yeah. would love that. Really, I would. I would love that. Actually, that sounds fantastic. Definitely. And I want to get you in when we get when we get the Mad Lounge up and running as well. I'd love to do a joint Facebook Live with you inside the group as well because I, I love the, the, uh, the, the stuff that you offer. Thank you. Oh, so good. So good. Thank you, Dan. We will ha actually, you'll have to maybe give us a follow up on this on, you know, a little bit later and do a chapter two of where you're at. Yeah, well, I'm going to in the next sort of week or two, I'm going to I'm going to decide on what my next run is going to be. So uh, uh, I'll let you know. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> note that this podcast or any other resources from cbtschool.com should not replace professional mental health care. If you feel you would benefit, please reach out to a provider in your area. Have a wonderful day and thank you for supporting cbtschool.com.